Showtime. Let's do this. All right, should be up and running. Let's double check. This is where it'd be nice to have a second screen so I could do this off on the side. <laughs> is there anybody even here? Um, how do I see how many people are in here? Uh, yeah, I, I can see. So it's definitely working. Users in chat. Okay, yeah, there's a few people here. Hi oh. there, Gaming Master LT. Right now Whoa, it's Whoa, okay, that's trippy. Yeah, the, the infinity hole. Yeah. Um, anyway, enough about that. Um, all right, well, welcome to those of you who've made it. Um, and on our behalf, you can welcome those who show up later, if you don't mind. Um, I am Jean-Marc Giffen. Um, I am one of the uh, rule engine programmers at Handelabra. And I also compose music for most of the games. And this little circle here is David. Why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hello, I'm David. Uh, I do a lot of rules programming and engine work, lots of card implementations, individual ones. Uh, and yeah, I don't do music, I'm just programming. <laughs> well, that's great because um, when we first started, I was the primarily the only one doing the engine programming. Um, and the music and it was really it was a hard challenge to balance um, yeah, it's a lot <laughs> being both so um things have gotten a lot easier for me uh, since you've been around yeah um all right and if anyone in the chat has any questions or um comments or um or any problems i guess if you can't hear one of us or whatever uh just type in the chat um i'll be having a slideshow running <clears throat> so i probably won't be able to see the chat but uh hopefully david can keep an eye on it i will um i am not sure who to tell but video three and rook city soundtrack playlist on youtube is still private uh, -huh. uh i don't know who handles that probably Krista but Krista. I will pass that along yeah thanks for letting us know because yeah those things are easy to miss if nobody reports it all right so let's get started on spirit island game development the slideshow this is in the way I'm just gonna move you out of the way here oh no now I can't right. see anything so yes, today we are going to talk about the rules engine of um, Spirit Island primarily. Um, so the technologies we use, um, we have uh, Unity uh, 2018. Um, most people I think now have at least heard of Unity if they haven't already made and released a complete game in it. Um, but it's essentially a 3D game engine. Um, and it, one of the big features of it is that it has support for uh, a huge number of systems. Um, so once you build a game in Unity, you know, you can export it to computers, consoles, phones, um, anything, and you don't, uh, you know, need to port it or do a whole bunch of extra work. Um, the biggest difference is um, just very handling different screen sizes. You know, if you make a tablet game and then you bring it to phone, um, you know, usually you have some work to do because just trying to shrink it down to a phone size that uh, usually doesn't work out super great. Um, we use Visual Studio, um, another big name for 
uh, editing and compiling code um, since you always need a text editor uh, when you program and uh, IDEs uh, integrated development environments like Visual Studio um, make it easier because they can point out problems uh, complete some code for you stuff like that um, we use uh, we code in the language of C sharp um, which is a general purpose object oriented programming language um, very similar to Java uh, with a few extra features. Um, to store data um, about the game itself, and we'll get more into this later, uh, we use JSON, um, which is a JavaScript object notation language. Um, and it's basically a way to make data human readable. Um, and we'll show you what that looks like in a bit. And to test the code, um, independent of uh, Unity is uh, we run some unit tests on our code and we use NUnit for that. Um, and again, you'll be seeing, with the exception of Unity, you'll be seeing all of this today. And next week, the code that we write this week, um, we will bring that into Unity and John can show you how all that stuff works. All right, so the basic system architecture here, um, we, what we do is we compile uh, everything we write into a DLL, dynamically linked library file. And this is, cons we call this the rules engine or just the engine. Um, and basically it can, it this whole thing uses the model view controller um, paradigm. The idea is that um, the model is responsible for containing all the data that um, the game needs to keep track of. So in the case of Spirit Island, it would be which spirits are in play and what do they have in their hands? Um, you know, which powers do they have? Where are the pieces? Where are all the cards? Um, how much health do the pieces have? Um, you know, anything that, uh, if you quit the game and you loaded the game again, uh, what information do you need to sort of pick up where you left off? Is sort of the way I like to think of the model because sometimes it can be a little unclear as to what you need there and what you don't. Um, the controller on the other hand is responsible for the game rules. Um, so you know like what the flow of the game is, what you are and are, aren't allowed to do and all that stuff. And, uh, and especially like the power logic. So each um, power has its own controller that says what that particular power does. Um, if the power card is never used, that code is never run, that controller doesn't matter, all that stuff. Uh, it still exists just to access, but it doesn't, never runs any code. Whereas the game rules are running all the time, every time you play. Um, and the controller has to get data from the model and it also has to update the data in the model. Um, but the controller never um, contains any data itself um, that it needs to know later. So it only stores data that it can use temporarily and then not worry about again. On the other side of things, and again, we're not covering a lot of this today, uh, I guess the unit tests a little bit, but um, we have the views. The views are anything that interact with the model and controller, but they themselves are not the model or controller. Um, so the three that we generally use in our projects are Unity. Um, you know, that's the one that uh, we send out to the public and that they play with. 
We have unit tests, and those check to make sure that um, cards do what they're supposed to, that the rules do what they're supposed to, that any edge cases are covered, um, that the model updates when it's supposed to, all those things. Um, so those are sort of individual chunks that only care about one thing when they run. And then sometimes we have a text console. So this is a way to quickly test our code interactively before there's a full Unity project running. And even when there is a full Unity project running, sometimes it's just faster to do it in a text environment. Um, we don't have one for Spirit Island because representing the board and what's on it would be uh, pretty ugly to do in ASCII and really hard to keep track of in your head. So um, we haven't really bothered much with this for this particular project. Um, but the views get data uh, from the rules engines. The rules engines send out game actions to the view. So just telling the view what's going on in the engine. And then the view has to send back any interactions that the, um, uh, that the view does. Um, so anything the player does in the game has to be sent back to the engine so it can decide what to do with it. Um, we're going to cover examples of this sort of stuff uh, in a little bit. Um, so now, what are the different layers? So um, we would say that there's different layers here. The model has three layers. The bottom one is called a definition, uh, and that's the JSON. And then on top of that is the definition objects. On top of that is the model objects. And then the controller just has one additional layer, and that's the controller for, for those model objects. And then the final layer on top of that is the view. So let's go over those one by one. So the JSON definition. So this just describes what you see when you look at the physical components. So we, you know, literally just take the components themselves or a, um, a spreadsheet thereof or whatever and we represent everything that you see as data. Um, so each thing has to have an identifier uh, if it's, you know, if it's sort of a unique thing. Uh, everything has to have some sort of title. Some of these are written in, like a card would be, other ones are just auto-generated by their parameters. Uh, in the case of a power card, it has an energy cost in this case, zero. Um, a power card also has element types that it has, in this case, sun, uh, water, and animal. Um, it has a power type. Uh, so that's like, is it innate? Um, is it a major power card, a minor power card, stuff like that. Um, they have uh, speed, it's not in the list here, but you can see it there, and target types. I didn't write everything that it has here. Um, range information, so how far allowed its way to go. And finally, the card text. Now, writing in the card text doesn't actually do any logic. Like, it's not like I can type the card text and the engine knows what to do with it. It's just so that when the view wants to show the card to the player, uh, it knows what to show. Um, so an example of that uh, is down here. So this is River's Bounty, so we just take out some of the characters for its identifier. The title is with those extra characters, the apostrophe in the space, energy cost zero, sun, water, animal. Uh, it's a unique card, so that means it's specific to a, a spirit. Uh, in this case, the river surges in sunlight. Speed is just a true or false value. If it's true, that means it's fast. If it's false, that means it's slow. If we had a third speed value, then we would have uh, made it um, an actual type. But because there's just two, we've just used a Boolean to uh, save a few resources. Um, range distance, in this case, is zero. Target type is any land. Uh, and that's an enumeration because there are 
all kinds of different target types you can have. And then body is just the card text. So gather up to two Dahan, and you'll notice the Dahan is in braces. Uh, that's because on the card itself, it's an icon. So that tells the, um, the view to do something special with it instead of just writing the word Dahan. And then if there are now at least two Dahan, add one Dahan and gain one energy. Um, so that we just do this for each card. Uh, we do it for the spirits. We do it for, um, I guess those are the main things, cards and spirits. And then, uh, and then that's just basically somewhere for us to store all the data of these components. Um, they don't actually do anything yet. It's just a place for it to reside in a computer and human readable format. So next on top of that, uh, we have the C-sharp defini definition objects. Um, and those turn JSON data into C-sharp objects so the game can interact with them because the game can't interact directly with JSON data. Um, so just as an example here, um, a power card definition, um, it has a de uh, identifier for it, the title, the energy cost, and for the most part, these are just like converting this, these into strings, that into an int, this into um, an array of enums, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just turning it into a C sharp object because so that you know the code can actually talk to it. That's pretty straightforward. Um, next is C-sharp model objects. This is pretty similar. Um, it gets a lot of the information from those definitions. Um, so it stores the C-sharp definition object, but it also has any information that must be a part of a saved game file. So uh, examples would be um, a spirit's energy. How much energy does the spirit have at this moment? Um, a definition doesn't know that. Um, the location of each card in piece. So, you know, like, where are they in the game? Um, and the current health of an invader or Dahan. So here's an example here. We have an island piece, which is an invader or Dahan. Um, and it has different things like um, what its health is, um, how much damage it's taken so far this turn, um what type it is uh and that kind of thing so you can imagine we need to keep track of these things i guess the type doesn't change but um so here's a simplified view of what the game looks like as a whole in the model so we have an entire game object and within that all the components are stored so um, we of course have an island, um, and that's made, up, so if you're familiar with Spirit Island, um, the island is made up of several boards that are, um, put together in a certain order, and David's going to talk about that a bit more later. Um, each board has a collection of lands, and then, uh, all the lands have some number of pieces. Um, also, the game has a collection of spirits. Um, so the spirits have grow options. So if you look at a spirit, you know, it has the, um, you, you choose which grow option to do and each grow option has like a collection of things you can do, like gain a power card, gain three energy, stuff like that. As presence tracks nodes, um, sometimes these are just the numbers to say, you know, how much energy it gains per turn, what the max card plays are per turn. But sometimes they have different things like elements or, um, or other tricks they have. Um, there are innate powers and special rules. Those are specific to each spirit. And then whichever power cards the spirit happens to have, um, you know, between their unique ones, 
uh, one major minor, minor card stuff like that. There's also a series of locations like the hand, the deck, the discard, but I didn't put those here because those are just those aren't really like special um, objects. Those are just locations for them to be. Um, and then innate powers and power cards uh, each contain their own power object, um, which has information about the power um, and as well as uh, its elemental options, especially in the case of a spirit's innate powers. Um, there, you know, there's a series of options at the bottom for what powers um, they can use based on which elements they have. Um, and finally, outside of these things, the game just has like which blight card am I using, which major and minor power cards are in the game. Uh, the, what invader cards are we using and where are they in the series of explore, build, blah, blah, blah. And then the fear cards and where they are. So are they yet to be earned? Have they been earned or are they discarded? Um, so, so now that, that we've covered the model, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the controller layer. The controller uh, lives on top of model objects and controls the behavior. Um, so for example, a card controller contains a card model object and the logic for that particular card. Um, but the big one is the game controller. And if you're familiar with the mediator pattern, that's basically what this is. Um, all objects in the game belong to a master game controller object which enforces the rules of the game. All other objects must go through the game controller to make sure they're not breaking any rules and to check for rule exceptions. So the game controller is not only responsible for the f general flow of the game, but whenever a card or a power or a spirit wants to do something, it has to tell the game controller what it wants to do or get information from the game controller. It can't just do it um, without consulting the game controller because it might be breaking a rule without knowing about it. So a little example I have here, um, you might need to know in a card if a particular land uh, contains a sacred site of a specific spirit. So the game controller has a, um, a method called does land contain sacred site of spirit and you pass the land and the spirit you're wondering about. Now, most of the time, if a land has one, more than one presence for a spirit, that spirit has a sacred site there. Um, so we would store this as sort of the base rule. But it's possible that a, another spirit or power overrides this normal idea. So for example, river surges in sunlight has a special rule. Your pre presence in wetlands counts as a sacred site. So now, um, once it's determined the base rule, it also has to ask um, the spirits in the cards, hey, do you have anything to say about this? Like, do you want to modify this, wh what we normally do here? And most of the time, it'll just be null. Like it won't, if it's null, it's not even checked. So it's only checked if we specifically tell it like, yes, this thing does care about that uh, and might change the answer. Um, so most of them just won't even bother, but uh, river surges in the sunlight says, hey, check, check with me first. And so if the land in question happens to be a wetland and the spirit happens to be the river, um, instead of null, it will return true. And so if this has an answer, then It'll, uh, it'll say, okay, never mind what we normally do. Let's just go with that answer. Um, and then it returns uh, whatever the, the result of that is. Um, oops, went backwards. And finally, we have the view layer 
Um, again, we don't do a ton with this in the engine other than test. So we have unit tests, test each rule, spirit, power, fear card, etc. in the game to make sure that they do what they're supposed to do. Um, obviously, you can't account for everything. So, um, you know, you can check that it does what it's supposed to do in certain situations. You can't necessarily like always account for that it won't do anything it's not supposed to in any situation. Um, but you know, those are things that we just find out from bug reports and all that. Um, you know, most of the time we're just concerned that it does what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to. Um, and generally it doesn't interfere when it's not supposed to do something. Um, so the Unity Game UI, this is the game that eventually is released to the public, uh, has all the graphics, sounds, and interactions that you would expect. Um, and it turns player input into game action. So clicking and dragging a power when the power is available to tell, to use tells, oh, use tells, okay, I don't know what use tells is. It tells the game that the player wants to use that power. Um, the controller layer then runs the code for that power according, accounting for all the rules. Um, and now David's going to uh, talk to you about some important engine concepts. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about the layers of the game, like the definition, model, uh, controller, and view. But the things that actually move the game forward are game actions. Sometimes you need to be able to stop and do interrupt the flow of the game and do something differently which are triggers, and you need to be able to tell the game what to do because this isn't an auto-playing game. You make decisions, and those are activations. And so uh, without those, it's just ink on cardboard. The, these are the things that actually make the game happen. So uh, if you... Uh, thank you. So, uh, game action is whenever something does anything that changes the model. The game, a spirit, a card, if it changes something, it's a game action. If the view needs to see it happen, it's a game action. Uh, so if you're moving a card from a place to another place, you would need a move card action so that the view would know, hey, show this card moving and the rules would know, hey, is this card allowed to move? Uh, that's the language through which uh, these, a these actions speak to the other parts, of the other layers in this system. Uh, so if you use a power, there's an action for that, the use power action, and, or like gaining energy. Like uh, some of these might seem pretty basic, like gaining energy. What's actually happening is a number is just going up. So why do you need an action? Well, you might need to know for some reason. Maybe you're not allowed to gain energy because of like a scenario rule. Or uh, maybe you need to save your game so that you, to like undo or something. Like there's a, anything that makes a change or like, you, you just got to go through actions so that everything else know, knows what's up. Um, so before an action occurs, uh, it goes to the view so the view knows what's happening and can display it to the players uh, so you know what's happening. And um, to make sure it's following all those rules, as I said before. Uh, and this is part of the command pattern, uh, which keeps uh, the information uh, encapsulated in a little package. Uh, so if you're moving a card, it knows what card is being moved, where it's going, etc. Um, and yeah, that's game actions. It's kind of weird to talk about it in those terms, but that like you need to know all the data for what's going on, uh, and you need to be able to check that across the multiple layers. So. We can move on to triggers, which I sort of alluded to this earlier. Uh, they respond to game actions. So when something happens, uh, something else happens. <laughs> uh, and triggers always have a specific type of action they respond to. So if 
you are um, a spirit that can stop an invader action like a build or a ravage, uh, you probably have a trigger that says, when they're building or ravaging, hold up, I can do something. The, a great example is uh, a spread of rampant green, who's a spirit that can stop those invader actions. Uh, so you check the criteria on the action. Is the invader building or ravaging? Uh, and then you have a response. So uh, if they're ravaging, I can destroy a presence and prevent that ravage. And then you have to a timing for the trigger. So some things happen before, like rampant green. You stop it before it happens. But sometimes things happen after, like um, the game checking to see if it's over. If all the blight is gone after the invaders ravage, a trigger checks to see if the game is over. Uh, so examples of things that happen before, like preventing damage, preventing invader actions, or increasing damage. There's a power card that increases damage, uh, and you would want to do that before the power happens and not after. <laughs> um, and things that happen after, like uh, things that would respond to pieces moving, like Thunder Speaker is a spirit that allows them to move their presence when Dahan would move. And you would want to wait to see where the Dahan are moving to say, do you want to move your presence with them? Uh, and obviously, as I said before, checking to see if the game is over. So those are triggers. Uh, and that leaves activations. So activations are interactions with the game functionally. Uh, a player clicks on something and the engine understands that an activation has happened and what to do. Activations go through the view and allow you, the player, or whoever's using the view, if maybe it's a test, uh, to communicate with the game and say, move this card here. Uh, examples are play card activation, where you would click on a card or drag a card to play it. Using a power, where you would, uh, that's an activation where you don't just say, hey, do this thing. You have to say, well, what do I do this thing to? Is it a, a power that targets a land? If so, which land? If it's a power that targets a spirit? If so, which spirit? Uh, and uh, some of them are require a little bit more information than that, like push pieces activation. A push in the game rules is you target a place, and you can take any number of pieces from that place and move them to adjacent places. They don't all have to go to the same place. So maybe you have three to Han, and you want to push each of them to a different land. So that activation would want all that information. Uh, so the view might have you click and drag three Dahan to different places, and that's one push pieces activation. Um, and the, the view basically, once it has the necessary information, tells the game, all right, you can go now, because uh, I know where this power is targeting, or I know where these pieces are moving. And then the controller goes ahead with the actual rule, the actual work of moving those pieces. Uh, and those are the three basic uh, sort of pillars of how the, the game moves forward, you know? You tell it what to do, it does it, and it stops and checks, am I following the rules? So Jean-Marc will go through some examples for you. Yeah, so here's an example of uh, how defense works in Spirit Island. Um, so <clears throat> when you're, you're in the uh, use power state, so that's the part of the game that you're allowed to use a power. Um, let's say nature's resilience is a power that's uh, you know available you pay you paid the cost and whatnot um, it generates a use power activation 
one of the properties of that is power to use, uh, in this case nature's resilience. And one of the properties is target, but it doesn't actually have one yet. Um, because it's not saying it's it's not saying hi I'm going to do this it's just saying I can be used that doesn't mean it will be it just means it can be um, so this activation is sent to the view um, and the view might for example highlight the power nature's resilience as how, so it might say it like flash or whatever that tells the player hey this is ready to be used now so let's say that the player cl clicks and drags from nature's resilience to wetland a2 on the board and then releases the mouse button the view uh, interprets that as that's what the player wants to do um, and now the view has information that the engine doesn't have yet and that's which land to a plot to uh, do this power in so in this case it's uh, wetland a2 so when they release the button the view says okay we want to use this use power activation and I need to give information to the activation so it calls a method on the activation called give info and then it sends uh, wetland a2 as the target so now the use power activation is updated so that it does have a target. However, it doesn't actually do anything with that yet. It just says, okay, now I know what power I am and I know what my target is. Once the view then calls proceed, that means, okay, go ahead, use this thing, do whatever you do. Then it's back to the controller. So the use power activation creates a use power action um, and again an action is just like okay I'm doing this whether you like it or not <laughs> view um, at this point so makes a use power action um, and it has similar properties um, not all activations have an, an action with the same name and same properties but in this case it does um, so the power to use the nature resilience and the target is wetland a2 it sends that action to the view and the view can show an animation of the power being used on wetland to a2 so I don't know there might be some particle effect or something that goes from the card to that land um, you know what it, whatever it happens to be that's up to you know the designer and the graphics artist to decide what that actually looks like but the engine doesn't care it just sends it over and then keeps going so when it uses the uh, power action um, the the actual contents of what um, nature's resilience power does now matters and it's just in this case it's just defend two in a land so um, nature's resilience code runs and it sends a defend action um, all actions have a source and in this case the source is nature's resilience card um, a defend action has to have a target land in this case wetland a2 and it also has to have an amount so that's uh, defending two in that land um, and this isn't shown here but this action will just um, f tell the model object of wetland a2 hey increase your defense by two um, so it's pretty pretty simple there um, and then it also sends that action to the view so uh, the view can show an animation of the defense being added so you know it might show a shield with the number two or something like that um, so that is one example, uh, and I'll give another one here. Uh, example of ravage being prevented by rampant green. So let's say there's a ravage action um, that is, because uh, again, like whenever the engine does something, 
changes anything, it has to use an action, so there's a ravage action. The source is the game controller itself, because this is part of the rules. You know, at a certain point, when you're in this phase, um, the invaders ravage. So there's no card or power telling it to do that. That's just the game itself saying, these are my rules, this is what we do. Otherwise, we're just going to sit and do nothing for the rest of time. Um, and it says, okay, right now, uh, because we're ravaging in mountains, we're going to focus on mountain A6. And then all actions have this is successful uh, Boolean, which by default is true. Uh, and most of the time it stays true. But again, before and after an action, that action is sent to the view. So before this action, it's... Um, Oops, this is breach trigger, but uh, it's actually rampant green trigger. Um, so that that action is sent out, and this is before the action takes place. Um, I said the view, but I mean to triggers, uh, which David talked about. So um, a spread of rampant green spirit has a trigger. It's looking for a ravage action. And in this case, it has one, so it's interested. Um, then, once it has that ravage action, it has to check the criteria. Does you know? Does this action meet my criteria? The criteria is that the target has a green sacred site. So it's saying, hey, okay, I have this ravage action. I'm going to check if Mountain A6 has a green sacred site. And if it does its response is it can destroy presence to cancel that ravage. Um, and again, the timing is before on this because after it's done the action, it can't cancel it because it's already happened. Um, so let's say, you know, this ravage action is coming in. There's a green sacred site. Uh, it says, okay, I'm going to destroy presence and cancel that ravage. So the first thing it does is destroy, use a destroy piece action, um, the piece being some green presence in mountain A6. And then uh, it does a cancel action. Um, what action is it cancel? So yes, there is a dedicated cancel action that also takes in another game action. So there's a cancel action. One of its properties is the game action that it's canceling, and in this case, it's the ravage action and it cancels that from moving forward. So all it really does in the end is set is successful to false. And before it runs the code on ravage action, it checks is successful. If not, then I don't do it. So the ravage action is not performed. Um, yeah. Uh, are there any questions? I can't see the chat, so you'll have to let me know if there are, David. Uh, HSTA wanted to know uh, what are our favorite board games? Oh. Um, well, Spirit Island's one of them. <laughs> yeah, for me as well. That's Major. why we're pushing <laughs> to, to do this one. Um, uh, another game I like, uh, Spectre Ops. It's a... Uh, asymmetric game where one person is sort of like a Scotland Yard where one person is hiding and sneaking around the board and everyone else is trying to catch them. Uh, it's very like Metal Gear secret agent-y. Mm, that sounds neat. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I always have to mention Settlers of Catan just because that's the one that really got me into... Um, to board gaming because prior to that like board gaming to me was like Monopoly and Clue and stuff that I honestly didn't find nearly as interesting as video games but then Catan was sort of the one that told me oh these actually can be as interesting as video games um, so I always have to mention that one I also really like Through the Ages um, I haven't played that on tabletop but I've played it on the app a number of times and uh, I love how it's basically like an entire game of civilization crushed down to an hour and a half instead of 30 hours 
Um, our single player uh, hostage negotiator is really neat. Um, it's a nice solo game. Um, and, you know, I can't always find somebody to play with when I want to play, so having a few solo games around is nice. Uh, and then I can get away from the computer and still still have fun. Um, yeah, and uh, I like, obviously, the other games we've done. Sentinels, uh, One Deck Dungeon, and, and Aeon's End. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions there? Uh, that's the only one I've seen so far. All right. Okay. Well, that was pretty easy. All right. So uh, one of the tricky things about um, the Spirit Island engine uh, that we haven't had to deal with before at all, even though this is our fifth game, um, is a board. <laughs> um, you know, none of our other games actually have boards. Well, um, bottom of the ninth had a board, but it was not a complicated board. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it basically had four different points, places that pieces could be, but I didn't even make up an object for that. I just had like... Four few, locations. Yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, but this is like the first one that has is like a serious board ga tabletop game. Uh, most of the games we have out there are primarily card driven, uh, and Spirit Island has a lot of cards too. But the board is very important. Mm -hmm. um, now the thing about this board, though, is you know it's not like a chess board where it's just a grid. Um, the shapes of um, of the the boards um, are like the lands on the boards and the board itself are irregular um you know they, they're not symmetrical and then um you can attach them to other boards in a number of configurations um so the tricky thing with that is like what's adjacent to what and how do we represent that especially going from one board to another that could be configured in a number of different ways. You know, if it was just a single board itself, you could hard code everything, but you can't do that when everything's modular. Um, so that is something that David was primarily responsible for with this engine, so I will let him guide you through it. <coughs> Alrighty. So this was an interesting challenge that I was very excited for because, as I said before, Spirit Island is one of my favorites. Um, and there is a lot to do here with boards. So let's start with the easiest stuff. We're going to go back to the, the layers again and look at the definition first. So definition holds this data that is immutable between games, no matter how like how no matter what happens, uh, board each board has eight lands and one ocean, uh, and they are board A's arrangement is always the same. Like uh, A two is a wetland, and A six is a mountain, and wetland A two is adjacent to jungle A three. So within a board. Uh, it is immutable. So we have these definitions of board A and what the lands are and what's adjacent within that board. Uh, so then you have the model object. Uh, um, uh, also, Jean-Marc, if there are some questions in the chat, uh, you can you let me know? Because I want to stop in between slides or uh, at natural stopping points, and I can't really watch both effectively. Um, um, well, I, I have to close down the uh, slideshow oh, slide to do okay. that. So you might just want to check in between your slides. Sounds good. I will do that then. So if you have questions, I will get to them. Uh, so, but anyway, we talked about the definition, the model. Uh, so this is data that can be changed and acted upon. So we need to know what boards are in this game. That's different between games. And... Um, so maybe you're using A, B, and C, this game. And they're arranged in a specific pattern, and we keep track of that. 
Um, and then we also keep track of which lands are adjacent to each other across boards. So maybe Sands B3 is adjacent to Mountain A1, Mountain A6, and Jungle A8 in this game. In a different game, it might be different. Um, and there are cards <laughs> that can uh, destroy a whole board. Not in the base game, but in Branch and Claw, uh, you can destroy a board. So maybe the boards that are in the game change uh, as you play it. So we keep track of that stuff in the model. Uh, so then uh, at the controller layer, uh, we keep track of sort of behavior uh, the behavior of the game. So like, if Ocean's Hungry Grasp is in the game, its controller will make sure to tell the game, hey, oceans aren't normally in play, but they are because I'm here. And the, con the game controller treats those oceans as if they were wetlands. Um, and so that, that's sort of how board handling interacts with the layers. But we're going to go a little bit deeper and uh, take a look at how we actually figure out things are adjacent to each other, because that is an interesting programming challenge. But first I will check the questions. Will Digital Spirit Island allow co-op with AI? I don't believe so. Not right now. There might be something in the future. I don't, I'm not going to say hard yes or no, because the future is mutable, but I don't think we have any plans to right now. Uh, AI would be pretty difficult and pretty new. We haven't don't usually put AI in our games. Um, but who knows? Maybe. Maybe someday. Uh, so JFF Dugan, I'm guessing you won't make it as far as talking about it, but I'd like to hear how you're controlling terrain spaces with Ocean's Hungry Grasp. Um... How do you mean uh, handling terrain, controlling terrain spaces? Uh, and while while I wait for an answer there, HSTA asked, uh, will you prepare the digital version of Branch and Claw? Uh, it's one of our stretch goals on our uh, Kickstarter, and we definitely want to do it, and people want us to do it. We did a poll, and... Uh, people said that they would prefer to have that over multiplayer. I would love to have both, but got to prioritize things. Hello, Cytosine. Um, so I, I have not seen a response from JFF Dugan as to what they mean about Ocean's Hungry Grasp and controlling terrain. Gotcha. So I answered your question. Awesome. So we're going to talk about adjacency handling. Uh, so as we mentioned before, there's an island model object which holds all the boards, and the boards hold all the lands, and it's sort of this recursive box in a box. Uh, and in the island model object, there is an adjacency matrix which is a grid sized for the number of lands in the game of bools. So uh, basically, you input uh, a hash of one land and a hash of another land, uh, and it will tell you yes or no, are those two lands adjacent? And that's very ha handy for easy to use and quick lookup when you're playing. Um, and that matrix gets generated once, usually, at the start of the game. As I mentioned, there's a card that can destroy a board, so anything that would change the layout of the board will regenerate that matrix. Uh, because you need to uh, start from scratch, because if a board is gone, then uh, adjacencies change, obviously. <laughs> uh, and so it starts by generating the data within the board because those adjacencies are always the same, but then it has special handling uh, for how the arrangements go together for things like a cross-board cross adjacency and corners. That's a tricky one because in Spirit Island, if corners are touching, they are adjacent. And that is 
tricky, as you will see. So on the next slide, we talk about a little bit how we handle interboard adjacency. There's some unwritten rules to the boards of Spirit Island. Uh, each board has three sides. The fourth one is the ocean, and that is never adjacent to another board. And you can tell that because three sides fit together modularly, and the ocean side doesn't. Uh, it doesn't fit with other, other boards. And something that is less obvious is that each side has six points on it where two lands can meet on that board edge. So there are six points, and these points are the same for each side of the board. But there's a clever trick. In order to put two board sides together, you need to rotate them. Because if they're the same when you're laying the two boards on top of each other, you have to rotate the board, thus mirroring it, to put the same two sides together. Uh, so those points never intersect weirdly. Uh, on the next slide, you'll see sort of an abstraction of it, where if you think of it as just a straight line with points on it instead of a squiggle, it gets a lot easier to manage uh, uh, like intersection and like what's adjacent to what. Um, so if like board A and B uh, both have they both have a jungle eight on them in the top right. As I said, you'd have to rotate them around to have them those boards meet. But if you rotate them around, those jungles are on opposite sides. Uh, even though they stop on the top edge in the same place. They don't touch and are completely different. Uh, so that's a very neat trick that uh, Eric used when designing these boards. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, uh, some visual aids, because a lot of text, I've thrown a lot of text at you. Uh, you can see sort of blue is like the top board and red is the bottom one. This is sort of an abstraction of what it looks like when two boards are intersecting. So you might have land B1, land B2, land B3, and land A1, A2, A3, and A4. And you can see these six points and how they never line up. Um, and so, but like this can still be a little bit messy to look at. So, what we did was we developed a little algorithm that looks at a single intersection because those are much easier to break down. Uh, and if you hop to the next slide, you'll see sort of a zoom in. Uh, if you look at just one intersection, uh, the number of possibilities for in, uh, what can be adjacent to what is significantly limited. And the logic becomes repeatable when looking at all the other intersections. Uh, so, on the next slide, we break down exactly what those possibilities are. Uh, there are two axes uh, when looking at this. Either land A1 stops at the point, or it doesn't stop at the point, as is illustrated left to right, and B1 stops at the point, or doesn't stop at the point, as is evidenced top to bottom. It's a truth table, kind of. Uh, and there are only four possibilities for what the adjacencies are here, and we can account for that. So that's like easily possible. If the top left situation is what's happening, A1 is adjacent to B1. B1 is adjacent to A1 and A2. B2 is adjacent to A2. And as you can see, this is easily answered for the other three possibilities as well. The easiest, obviously, being neither stops. A1 and B1 are next to each other. <laughs> um, and so with this trick, we're able to basically repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and build that adjacency matrix between boards. Uh, so the next thing I'm not going to quite jump into because uh, it is corners. I'm going to check the chat first, see if there are any questions. But that one is a little bit trickier, but we also have an answer. So let's see. Um, OK. 
curious about how Ocean will be implemented. Excellent way to handle modular boards. Thank you, Cytosine. I'm pretty proud of this. This was an exciting challenge. Uh, I appreciate your slide presentation. Much easier to absorb that info from the written structure to the verbal part and visual as well. Uh, Sorry if this is already answered. Which spirit do you guys like to play as the best? And which ones are you most interested, or were the most interesting or challenging to program? I'd imagine Oceans and Serpent had some unique challenge challenges. Well, Serpent is a stretch goal because it's not part of the base game. And right now we're just trying to get the base game funded and uh, make that. Serpent certainly will be a challenge when we get to it. And we're still working, obviously. Um, so let's see. My favorite spirit to play as is probably either Ocean or Thunder Speaker, uh, or Rampant or uh, Spread of Rampant Green. Ocean, if I'm feeling like I want to be impactful and sort of like a big, a big engine to destroy the invaders, supported by my team. Uh, Rampant spread of green if I want to help my team and support my team when they're playing some more higher impact spirits like earth or fire uh, and thunder speaker because you can get really wild with the damage from thunder speaker and uh, gathering a bunch of Dahan into a, like a ball and rolling them around the board uh, and I find that exciting uh, Jean-Marc do you have any favorites? Um, yeah, I mean, when I play, I usually try and change which spirit I'm using, um, you know, just to kind of make the game feel diff a little different each time, because um, I'm usually playing with new players, like, it seems almost every time I play, I'm playing with somebody new, um, so, you know, we're not adding scenarios and adversaries and stuff. So to keep the game feeling di a little different each time I change up who I'm playing with. So I haven't really settled on any particular spirit. Um, but yeah, I did, in, I did notice that um, playing as um, the Thunder Speaker did make the game feel different because the Dahan aren't just like... Like it feels more like the Dahan are actual like military pieces um, more so than they're in the regular game where they sort of just have a a passive like uh, destruction capability now it's much more active like you're on the you're on the island with them kind of thing um, but I also like playing as uh, the heavy defense uh, spirits like uh, the earth spirit um, as long as there's somebody else to actually um, generate fear because you know you don't generate a lot of fear just by defending everything so um, yeah so you ready to I think so it doesn't look like there are any more questions okay uh, so let's talk about corners these are pretty wild, actually. Uh, so because corners touching count as adjacent, just the, just the points in this image, a, land A and land C are adjacent. So our previous method doesn't account for this. So it would find A and B adjacent. It would find B and C adjacent, but not A and C. And so the solution is if a corner land is adjacent to two or more boards, it just shares that adjacency. So because B is adjacent to both A and C on separate boards, it just says, hey, you two, have you met? Uh, and the A and C become adjacent. And uh, it's a nice and simple rule that is a little bit complicated to implement because of uh, the checking these sort of things. A lot of this stuff is easy to the eye, but harder to the computer. Um, but uh, that rule handles it pretty effectively. So if you go to the next slide, we talk about some odd, different and odd situations for that. So like if you add a fourth corner, uh, the rule still applies. Uh, 
A is adjacent to D and B, C is adjacent to B and D, so A and C are adjacent to each other, B and D are adjacent to each other. And even if you do weird angles, like a weird board configuration where like A and D aren't touching each other, so that would seemingly break the rule, but because B and C are acting as intermediaries here, sharing their adjacencies with their neighbors, A and D sort of whisper down the lane to becoming adjacent. And it's sort of neat to see how that happens, actually, sort of almost organically, by following that simple rule. Uh, and uh, it seemed like this was about, figuring this out was about as complicated as figuring out the uh, other adjacency rules, even though it's a much more elegant solution. <laughs> so there's a lot of crazy tricks to these board arrangements. Um, but that concludes everything that uh, about boards. Um, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but we have something else for you as well. Uh, we are going to get into the nitty gritty and program a power card. Bum, ba -dum. <laughs> All right. So yeah, um, that was a good explanation, and thank you for handling the board adjacency stuff in the engine too, because um, that was something that was just driving me nuts. I don't know if it's just <laughs> I'm not visual enough to think about it, but I, I was just like I just. I don't understand what to do. <laughs> it was really hard, but very exciting for me. I, that was a problem that got me like revved up. Mm -hmm. So I was happy to tackle that one. Wow. So is range then check adjacency up to its number? I don't quite understand the question, Twitson. Uh, oh, okay, I think I do actually. So when you're range checking, so range one, range two, you check, that's how many, how far away you check for uh, if a land is, can be targeted. So yeah, basically. So if it's range zero, it's no adjacent lands, just the land where you have the presence. But if it's one, it's any, it's the land where the presence is or any one adjacent to it. If it's two, you check two adjacencies out. It's basically degrees of separation. Mm -hmm. So if you have a, most powers end at range two because once you get to three, you can cover the basically the whole board. Um, cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just as a little fun exercise an example because maybe some of this stuff is still feeling a little abstract um, we'll do a concrete uh, implementation of pillar of living flame so this one costs a whopping five energy it only gives you fire uh, I mean living flame right like what else is it gonna give you <laughs> um, and it's a slow power so you have to use it during your slow power phase or after the invaders have gone it can go up to two away from a sacred site uh, but it can target any land type it generates three fear um, it deals five damage in the land you've chosen and if the target land is a jungle or a wetland it also blights the land so Ideally, you want to do this in um, mountains or sands, but you know sometimes it's worth the cost of blight. Um, additionally, if you have a total of four fire elements, um, you increase both the uh, fear and the damage, um, and thankfully not the blight. So uh, it's definitely advantageous to have. A lot of fire going on when you play this. So um, I'll just keep that there. Um, so if I had this in a spreadsheet or whatever, I'd just copy and paste it, but I'll just do it manually. 
since it's not that big a deal. Um, so this is the power card list. This is the definition of all the power cards in the game. Um, and then alphabetically, it would just go in between these two. Um, and then so often I just copy an existing one and fill it in that way. It just saves me a little bit of work. So pillar of living, whoops, flame. Um, copy that. Mm, mm, mm. Energy cost is five. Fire just has the fire element. Uh, it is a major power. I just happen to know this. Also, if um, most of the power cards have this if you have thing that most minor cards do not. Speed is false because it's slow. Um, right, so now uh, range distance is two. Range sacred site, as in must it be away from a sacred site? Normally it's false by default, so we have to manually put it in as true. Target type any land, we can leave that as is. And then the body is three fear. Um, and because there's a new line here, uh, I do it as another uh, element in this array. Five damage. If target land is jungle wetland. So this is like, um, you know, a special icon because you see how they're attached together. So we don't want to put jungle as one thing and then wetland as another because otherwise they would be separated. Um, so if it's add one light. And that's pretty much it for the definition. Um, the, you know, these usually don't take long on an individual level. Um, but you can imagine that putting all this information in all at once for every card, uh, you know, would take a good portion of your of your work time. Um, but we usually do cards one by one. So that's as much as we need to do for that. Um, so the next thing that we do, uh, we don't have to worry about the model layers um, because those are generic. So those just pass, basically they just pass on all this information up to the controller. Um, and we have a factory that when it makes the controller for this power card, it's looking for specifically any a card whose class name is the identifier, power of living flame, plus power controller. So pill, whoop, pillar of living flame power controller. We just make that a basic class. And then all power cards um, extend the uh, power card controller. Let's go ahead and auto generate the constructor for that because we don't need to do that manually. And then they must override. Um, the uh, use power method. And it returns an ion numerator. Um, I don't really want to get into what ion numerators are to a deep level, but basically there's something that Unity needs uh, in order to pause the engine long enough for it to do an animation or whatever. Um, if we don't use I enumerators, then the engine would just keep plugging forward as the view is trying to catch up. And sometimes the view would get uh, pieces of information well before it needs it. So is the simple answer to that. So 
Uh, let's ignore the if you have for now and just pretend that that's not there. So three fear. Um, so the first thing that we do is generate this. So we call the game controller and we say generate fear. Um, whenever, so basically like, again, because we're using the mediator pattern, we're, the, the, the power controller is not allowed to just go ahead and generate fear without telling the game controller about it. Um, and when you do this, you say, okay, what's the source? What is interested in generating fear? This is so that the game controller can look at it. This is so that the view can look at it. Um, you know, because otherwise the view might be like, okay, I'm generating fear, but I have no idea why. Um, so this gives it some clue as to what's going on. So usually it's just the word this, because we pass in the pillar of living flame power controller into here, and the amount of fear, which in this case is three. Um, and then there's some boilerplate code uh, that we need to run whenever it's in a numerator. We're just going to change this value to E here. Um, again, I don't want to explain too much about this, but it's basically just necessary for Unity to be happy with the code. Um, we've gone back and forth a few times on whether or not we need to do this, and we've determined that we do. So um, there it is. Um, so the next thing is five damage. Um, so again, we can just reuse the same enumerator. Um, deal damage. And uh, yeah, we're, so we're actually, hold on here, I'm just gonna check. Okay. Yeah, distributing the damage in the land. Um, yes, I did write things ahead of time just to make sure. Um, so again, we send uh, this is the source. And then um, which is, so then we're saying which spirit is actually dealing the damage. So the spirit dealing the damage is whichever spirit played this card. So we say this card dot owner spirit, and that tells us which spirit is playing the has played or owns or whatever this particular card. Um, the target land uh, is provided for us right here. Now it's a power target because um, lands aren't the only thing you can target. Some powers target uh, other spirits, right? So you can't always assume it's a land, but in this case we know it will be. So we just cast it here. Target as land controller. We can do that in line too. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then the amount of damage, five. Um, so yeah, basically we know which land we want the damage to be distributed in, and now we're saying, okay, now we need to distribute five damage within a land. Um, if there's only five damage worth of targets, you know, like say um, a city and two explorers, it'll just go ahead and do it automatically. Um, but if there's any more than that, it'll send an activation to the view uh, asking how to distribute that damage. If target land is jungle or wetland, so you just do a little if statement here, land is jungle or land is wetland, what do we do? Add one light. Um, so again, E, okay, oops. Add some blight and in the same land. Um, and this time, there's actually a two step process here just to save some uh, performance speed. So we go make the uh, add blight object, 
The E is actually game controller do action light. Um, we originally had this so that uh, you did this all in one line, like it would just be here. Um, but we can actually get a bit better performance if we separate it out into two separate lines. We've done this recently, um, and it speeds up the game significantly enough that we do this as regular practice at this point. Um, if there's a lot of logic involved, like there is here, then we don't do that because because uh, otherwise you um, uh, you're basically expanding the amount of work you have to do each time. Um, and so that's it for the base case. And now we'll say if you have four fire. So we have a basic Boolean here that's use elements. So it already has considered two things. One, that you have the required elements to do it. And two, that you've chosen to do it because this is optional. Um, in most cases, you want to use the optional thing of powers, but there are certainly reasons why you might not want to, to use them. Um, so if we get use elements true, um, we've already gone through the steps of making sure you have it and that you want to use it. So we can just assume this. Um, so here we would say three, fear is three if use elements um, fear plus gets two. Um, so that's one way to do it. Another way would be um, var fear gets use elements. Uh, if true five, if false three. Um, and I think, I think I'll just do that since this is a fairly straightforward thing here. Um, you know, there's always the um, sort of balance between being uh, explicit, like, and readable, but also being readable and stuff. And I think for this particular case, it's simple enough. Are we using elements? Yes. Five. No. Three. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, for damage, uh, same idea. Image use elements uh, ten, otherwise five. All right, uh, and I'll put that here in the comments. Let's see any questions? Um, oh, okay. Just Power. Awesome discussion. <laughs> yeah. So is the range then check adjacency up to the number? The only bot that matters is the last one on the card. Light. Um, light, right. Yeah, so just some back and forth here. Okay, so no, no real question, but uh, some discussion, so that's good. Um, all right, so um, the next thing I do when we implement a new card is uh, just let the game know that we've uh, implemented it. So add it here. Um, because we don't, even though, you know, there are some other cards, uh, that we haven't implemented, we just want to be explicit about like, yes, this is available. I have implemented this. It has the code. It's ready to go. So we just keep a list here. Um, and it's also useful for the view to look up, uh, all the possibilities without having to, you know, make a game with everything. Um, so, um, just run that. Has some failures because I implemented it and then 
just to test it out and then removed it and so I think that's what those failures were about is that it was surprised that the card was gone okay um, right so now a specific um, test for this card So this is um, a unit test, and this is to check to make sure that the game does what it's supposed to with that particular card. All right, so what we might do is um, we'll use it without elements um, first on a jungle. So it'll do three fear, five damage, and one blight. Um, and then the next time we will have elements and we'll do it on sands. So it'll do five fear, 10 damage, and no blight. Um, so no elements on uh, jungle. Um, Right, so uh, go to uh, slow power. Then we have a little helper that we can just put in the name of a particular card we want to test. Um, we like to add a bunch of helpers like this because we have to write a lot of tests. So anything that speeds up the process uh, is usually a good idea. Um, so which one? Jungle uh, A8. We have all the um, lands in a, a, a as properties, global properties, so that we can access them quickly here. Um, but now we need to know specifically, like, okay, we've done that. Um, so generated three fear. That's easy enough to test. Um, assert blight. Whoops. Um, number of blight and land. One. So um, this is going to go to the slow power phase. The helpers will have already taken care of a few things. One, it'll make sure that power of living flame is in the sp first spirit's hand at the start. Um, it'll make sure they have enough energy to pay for it. And then in the um, pay for powers uh, phase, it will automatically pay for it and put it out there and then on the slow power phase it'll go ahead and use it on jungle a8 so you can see how much this is taken care of for us just by this little helper here so let's see if at least that much works doesn't let's see what's going on expected to have generated three fear but was four so what's happening here and I can guess this before I even look at the output, is um, is that uh, this also deals damage. And jungle A8 uh, already has um, a town in it at the start of the game. So that town is being destroyed, that generates one fear, so now at the end we end up with four. Um, so that's one of the tricky things when you're writing tests is sometimes it does something in addition to what you actually are trying to test. Um, so uh, we'll have to account for that. So generate three fear plus one from the town. So four. Um, and then another thing that can get in the way is randomness. So let's say um, 
that at the start of the game a jungle card is explored and then they also build well then by the time they get to slow power they're going to have a town um, an explorer and a city um, and so if it destroys that city with the damage then it'll add another two so we need to make sure it's not a jungle we basically we have to decide is it a jungle and I will account for that or is it not a jungle and I won't um, uh, oh, yeah so new stream and then so let's say that we do just so that we're making sure use of all five of that damage um, so this means invader card that's jungle at level Terra level one um, Terra level and uh, not Terra level um, invader card level and then uh, go to uh, in starting invader actions and make sure it's jungle one so now when we get to here we know that there's one town one explorer and one city um, because we're dealing five damage the usually what you want to do is get rid of the bigger things there are certainly reasons why you wouldn't do that but we're just considering a basic case here so our helper will automatically get rid of the uh, city and the town um, so what I might do here just to make sure that we're not assuming too much um, is actually go to the build state and then assert land uh, number of pieces so we're talking about jungle a8 as one explorer one town one city zero to Han, zero blight and I pretty sure it'll have one presence because of the spirits uh, the default spirit one is the earth spirit and I think he has a piece there um, you know sometimes I just have to use my memory and then run it to see if my memory is accurate um, right so it was yeah so it ran that it and that was that was good and then um, so it's plus one from town plus two from city um, so we actually expect it to be six uh, right um, add one blight so now instead of doing just asserting the blight it makes sense to assert the number of pieces again and the explorer will still be there but the town will be gone a city will be gone it'll have one blight and the presence remains uh, untouched actually it doesn't it would be gone because uh, adding the blight would get rid of the the presence so it's actually good that it has the presence because then we can double check that part as well and if we run it again we see it passes so that means everything here happened as we expected it to so add one blight and the uh, town and city are destroyed um, now you know if something does go wrong or you just want to double check what's going on you can see the output here um, it's sort of human friendly and sort of not <laughs> um, you know it's very verbose and that's something you would want to read if you were playing the game for fun but is useful for debugging so I will just ignore some of the sections here and jump to the uh, parts that are most most important um, so pillar of moving flame move to vital strengths play area this is during the power power cards to play phase um nothing resolves all, all along here and the invader builds um they build a town we're only interested in jungle eight and again a city is added there um 
and then during the slow power okay so these are the activations so the earth spirit can either use pillar of living flame or continue that means just not use it at all um, so they do use it generates three fear okay as we expect and now an activation comes in distribute five damage between three targets um, and then because we didn't specify which targets it's just auto doing it and that's fine because that's what I would have done anyway um, in a lot of cases um, so to city three it's dealing three damage and to town it's dealing two damage um, which you can see actually happening here this is just sort of a here's what I want to do here's it actually happening and then they're moved out of the game which is where they go um, when they're destroyed um, and then that generates an additional three fear because it's a city and a town uh, and then blight moves to the board and uh, Earth's presence is moved out of the game um, because whenever you add blight you have to destroy presence so that's just a way to double check that you know everything is doing what uh, it needs to um, or to see what's wrong if it's not doing what it's supposed to um, so yeah any questions here looks too busy um cool so that's without elements and on a jungle so maybe no elements jungle so maybe let, let's do a second test and we'll say use elements and sands um, so we'll do a sim whoops We'll do a similar thing here. Um, let's see here. Sands what exactly? Um, okay. Maybe I'll do, um, just trying to find one that already has some pieces on it. Just none of them. So we can, we can manually debug it and put those pieces that we want there. Um, so. Right, so it would just have an explorer and a town, no city, no presence by this point. I'll just comment this out for now. Sometimes it's good to just write a little bit, run the test, make sure it does everything you expect up to that point, and then continue, because otherwise you're going to get stuck anyway. Should be one explorer on land jungle A8. Oh, right, I forgot to change this. Sands, which one? Uh, let's go with four. A4. I might not be able to reach that with the uh, Earth Spirit. And then, yeah, there's one blight already there from the beginning of the game no it can reach it right because it's range two that's good okay so we've reached there but now we need more pieces to actually test that 10 damage it's doing um, so we're just gonna go ahead and add some um, add some pieces here add island pieces um, Let's see it already has an explorer in a town so I don't know how about let's do three cities so three on sands a four and we'll just double check that so now it should have three of these okay that's good and then we go to slow power and then we apply it to sands a four 
Um, so it generates three fear. But now it's actually going to destroy three cities and an explorer. Um, so it'll get plus um, plus six from the city. That's actually nine, and that'll be enough to uh, get a fear card. So it'll actually go back down to one. I'm pretty sure. Um, I guess we'll see in a second here. I'll just comment this out for now. Uh, oh, okay. Um, oh, right. So it's plus, plus two fear and plus five damage. So, right, it would be th three and we have, um, Assert location. What's going on here? Come on, Visual Studio, give me what I need. Number of cards at location, that's the one I needed. So, fear earned. Um, and it should have a card. Right, before it doesn't. It's good to have a before check and an after check just to make sure that like this didn't wasn't already here from some lingering effect. Um, obviously this isn't foolproof because something could have interfered, but it at least narrows down the range of error. Um, let's see here. Uh, what's going on? So let's see. Generated three fear. Okay, right. So we haven't actually used the elements yet. Um, that's what's going on. So uh, let's say here gain elements earth. Element type fire, and we'll just put that three times. Obviously, we could have made it so that it's just gain. I guess we could, yeah, I guess it's maybe it's simpler to do something like this. Yeah, okay. So um, they have three, they already have one from playing the card itself, so that's a total of four. So that should hopefully make a difference. Let's take a look. Uh, still three. What am I doing wrong here? Three fire. Is it not using them? Use elements true. Hmm. Oh, okay, I didn't even add that to the definition. Um, so it doesn't even know about that stuff. All right, um, it's just human error. All right, cost fire four. Um, plus two, oops, plus two fear and plus five damage okay so yeah without this definition it just assumes it doesn't have any element options um, so it never made them so this uh, this use elements will always be false so hopefully that fixes that yeah so now it's green um so we earned one fear card and still have three generated fear left over um and it does not add blight uh, 
so three cities, one explorer are destroyed, no blight. So get rid of the explorer, get rid of the three cities. Uh, now it already had one blight, so basically it means it doesn't add another one or cascade or anything. Um, here we go. Let's just copy that over and take a look. So generated five fear. That's just from the card itself. Distribute 10 damage between five targets. Automatically does three to each city and then one to the explorer. Um, and then destroys them. And then that uh, right, so it generates three fear, so it has to generate six total. So it generates three. That brings a total up to eight, which is how much is needed to get a fear card. So belief takes root, move to, moves to the fear earned. Um, the fear pool resets to zero, and then it generates another three. To finish it off. Um, so this is similar to how it would work if you were playing, um, you know, by hand on the tabletop. And then, uh, right, so that's just the end of it. There's no plate added. Cool. Um, yeah, so there you go. Two, two tests. Let's just run them again. This yellow means that there are some that are being skipped for various reasons. Um, so that's not a big deal. Basically, we just don't want to see red there. Because um, red means something failed. Which isn't a huge deal most of the time. You know, there's usually just some random factor or whatever. But um, it's better to just not see it. And we don't. Um, so that's it. That's a full implementation of Pillar of Living Flame um, and a fair overview of how the engine works.